Hello, and welcome back to Missouri Civil War. Last week, I described the factors that motivated irregular fighters in Missouri and the struggle by Unionist forces to contain them. In our sixth week, I continue with those two themes. Today, we consider the broad support that guerrillas enjoyed in much of the state and the ways that support posed an intractable problem for Union authorities. The next two lectures will examine the Army's increasingly stringent anti-guerrilla policies, and then the late summer of 1863, when the climax of the guerrilla war brought perhaps the most forceful actions that the U.S. military ever brought against American civilians. We begin today by studying the vital roles that women played by sustaining this pro-Confederate guerrilla insurgency. We'll then consider ways that gender shaped the Civil War in Missouri. What roles did women assume amid the disorder of wartime? How did ideas about masculine honor and manhood influence fighting? Lastly, we'll look broadly at life in Missouri during this guerrilla conflict. The diaries of Elvira Scott and John Dryden give us a sense of the deep anxiety that it brought, but they also remind us that in some ways, life continued on. In the words of historian Leanne Weitz, the mothers, sisters, wives, and sweethearts of Missouri guerrillas served a crucial role. They functioned, in Weitz's words, as the domestic supply line. According to Professor Weitz, women were not mere victims in the guerrilla war, although today we'll see that they surely suffered in many ways. Instead, women functioned uh, as a systematic part in the ways that guerrillas fought. As the domestic supply line, female kinfolk provided guerrillas with the food, clothing, uh, and most importantly, information about Union troops. Historian Joseph Beeline has recently done really interesting work on the unique kinds of shirts that Missouri women provided for their guerrillas. These guerrilla shirts, as you can see, are very elaborate and finely detailed. And like the flags that women produced and gave to companies of regular soldiers, these shirts become emblems of the fighters' connections to their kinfolk and to the home front. Women also provided guerrillas with shelter and forage and fresh horses. They served as spies, relaying critical information, and they often helped to conceal guerrillas and they covered for them when Union patrols came looking. Observers were quick to note the important role that women played in helping the guerrillas. One Union newspaper in Kansas City wrote, so perfect is this spy system that a squad of troops may march and countermarch all over the country and not find a single bushwhacker, and yet hundreds of them lie concealed within 20 rods of this column. With the aid of these spies dotted all over the country and living in perfect security, a hundred bushwhackers may defy the utmost efforts of 500 soldiers to exterminate them. Gender shaped the Civil War in Missouri in another important way. In, according to the Code of Masculine Honor that linked Victorian society in both the North and the South, violence was not to be inflicted directly upon white women. Guerrillas, too, took pains to emphasize that they never raised a hand against women. This point bears remembering as we consider the chaos that comes in the summer of 1863. Women were be, to be spared violence directly, but they suffered indirectly in some, frankly, awful ways. Their husbands, fathers, sons, and brothers were often brutalized and killed in plain sight. And the fact that fighters would not strike women directly did not mean that they refused to prey upon them for food, money, and other goods. So the key point here is that women were not simply on the periphery of this mess, as a bunch of rowdy, lawless men carried on. Rather, Missouri women were often at the very center of things. Um, in rural Missouri, there was no neat distinction between the battlefield and the home front. Uh, here, the Civil War becomes a struggle between entire societies. Inasmuch as this war extended antebellum social roles, with men serving as protectors and women as nurturers, fulfilling such roles was almost impossible for men and women of color. Every slave, male or female, was vulnerable to the abuse and the capriciousness of their masters. Violence for them remained a constant presence. 
Slave women did indeed shoulder domestic responsibilities as wives and mothers, in addition to their agricultural work outside of the home. And as African American men volunteered for military service, their efforts to liberate and protect their families will give us some of the most striking readings of the entire war. For the duration of the course, it becomes clear that the Civil War, Civil war is bringing profound changes to Missouri. Slavery begins to disintegrate, civil institutions wither and sometimes collapse, uh, immigration, Railroad expansion, the, the major developments of the pre-war years, they had come to a stop. Uh, the physical landscape is in ruins. Uh, men go off to fight, sometimes many hundreds of miles away, and with their husbands, sons, and brothers gone, Missouri women assume new roles. They manage farms and shops and everyday affairs. But in other ways, everyday life, or a semblance of everyday life, went on. Churches continued to hold services. Farming and commerce persisted, but like so many things, in, including child rearing, they did so under the strains of deprivation and fear. The experiences of two people, Elvira Scott and John Dryden, remind us of the anxieties that hung over Unionist and pro-Confederate Missourians across the state. Elvira Scott, a name that's come up before, lived in Saline County. It was the part of the state that became known as Little Dixie, and it's thus not surprising that she sympathized with the South. When Scott began keeping a diary in 1860, she made clear that she opposed secession, like many Missourians. But when the war came, she heaped most of the blame upon Lincoln and the Northern Congress. Southern men, she argued, fought to defend their homes and families. When business pulled her husband away to St. Louis, she took over management of the family's general store, the cash and barter. When the couple eventually decided to relocate to the city and then to Iowa for the war's duration, it was Elvira who settled the store's debts and arranged for the sale and shipment of the family's possessions. Scott had found that her greatest challenges came at home where she was beset by demands from all sides. Guerrillas, for example, sometimes turned up wearing their enemies' uniforms in order to gain information. Pro-Confederate guerrillas visited the home seeking aid in 1863, but she was reluctant to oblige. Supply their breakfast, she feared, would mean that Federals would likely burn her house. The alternative, she learned, was no better. A guerrilla told her, well, madam, if you don't do it, we will burn the house. You take your choice. She made that breakfast. But survival, quote, in these days of terror, end quote, as she described them, required a certain flexibility. One took care not to seem too loyal in the presence of rebels. When watched by Unionists, one was careful to not appear too secesh. On July 23, 1863, she likened her predicament to a person who was between fires. Vulnerability left few good choices. She wrote that on one occasion a man pointed a gun at her face. Kansas militiamen once took her husband hostage, pending the release of captured Union men. They soon let him go and took only a small amount of food from the farm. She noted bitterly, though, that before the red legs left, they intentionally destroyed her roses and her strawberry plants. Another time, federal soldiers arrived demanding not only dinner and feed for their horses, but also that Scott and her oldest daughter play piano while they ate. The Scots complied, playing for nearly two hours, but Elvira later described the incident as degrading and obscene. Missouri households that fed and sheltered guerrillas faced aggressive retribution. As Frank James's growing notoriety as a Clay County bushwhacker brought sharp scrutiny from Unionist militia, troops visited the home of his mother, Zerelda James Samuel. The troops found no guerrillas, who were instead hiding in the nearby woods, and so the militiamen seized and tortured James's stepfather, Reuben Samuel for details about the guerrillas' movements. They slipped a noose around Reuben's neck, and as they began to hang him from a nearby tree, he confessed where the guerrillas were hiding out. The troops charged after Frank James and his company. Most of them escaped, 
and they later returned to the farm. At a later time, Zorelda was jailed. And this was a sign of how federal policy toward women hardened as the war raged on. Zorelda was released after signing a loyalty oath, but that hardly changed her support for the South. A Union captor later wrote that Jesse James's mother was, quote, one of the worst women in the state, end quote. Jesse James, who was also roughed up by Union men that day, later pointed to these incidents as a key turning point in his own life. The diary of John Dryden illustrates the difficulty for Missourians who had hoped to keep their head down and to stay out of the war. Dryden was a farmer in Vernon County along the Kansas border and not far from the settlements that had been raided by John Brown in 1858. Dryden was a Union man. He was anti-slavery. But in an area dominated by rebel sympathizers, he learned to generally keep his political opinions to himself. Yet, it was difficult to keep one's loyalties a secret in such a small community. And as Elvira Scott understood, the mere suspicion could be enough to invite attention. Dryden, like Scott, caught it from both sides. Even though he was a Unionist, the local board of loyalists that drafted the list of people subject to an assessment, they put Dryden's name upon it, forcing him to surrender $100 and 100 pounds of honey. Dryden found that pro-Confederate guerrillas could strike at any time, but it was nighttime that proved most dangerous. He repeatedly hid in nearby fields while the men he called Midnight Minions insisted that his wife give him up. On the night of May 27, 1863, five bushwhackers set the family's home ablaze. They retreated only after Dryden fired upon them with his shotgun. Why is it that I am troubled so much with these villains, Dryden later wrote, merely because I am loyal to the government. His wife, Louisa, managed to extinguish the flames that night, and after another fraught month along the border, the Drydens decided to abandon Missouri for safety somewhere further west. For next time, we'll see how exasperated Union commanders attempted to deal with such escalating violence. Until then.